Hi, I'm Graham Priest and this is the fifth of uh, a series of short lectures on logic that we've been doing. In the last lecture I talked about paraconsistency. Paraconsistency is the view that contradictions don't imply everything. So the principle explosion, which says that contradictions do imply everything, is not valid according to a paraconsistent logic. And I noted that explosion is normally taken to be valid in standard and orthodox theories of logic, but there are these things called paraconsistent logics in which it's not valid. We also looked at uh, some reasons why you might think that it's a good idea to use a paraconsistent logic. I gave you a couple of reasons, but um, in both those reasons, there was information which is inconsistent where you don't want everything to follow. But there was no suggestion that the information you have is actually true. Now, today I want to talk about the thought that some of these inconsistent bodies of information, that is some contradictions, might actually be true. In which case, you certainly don't want to have an explosive logic because once you've got one true contradiction, if you have explosion, you'd have everything, which is slightly too much. So let, let's start with a definition. Um, a dialethia is a true contradiction. Yeah, that is, it's something of the form P, and it's not the case that P, such that, that both of these are true. And dialethism is the view that there are such things. So what we're going to be talking about in this lecture is exactly dialethism. Now, dialethism is a highly unorthodox view. So there's something called the principle of non-contradiction. And the principle of non-contradiction says that contradictions cannot be true. So it's just ruling out dialethism. And the principle of non-contradiction has been high orthodoxy in Western philosophy. So in the metaphysics, Aristotle sets his sights on it and gives an extended argument for the principle of non-contradiction. I'm not going to talk about that now, but the truth is that it's not very good. There's one long major argument, and critics and commentators cannot even agree how it's supposed to work, let alone that it works. And then there's a bunch of very short arguments, some of which are clearly beside the point. However, uh, let's set that matter to the side. Aristotle's attack on dialetheism launched the principle of non-contradiction into orthodoxy in Western philosophy. So much so that there has hardly been uh, an extended defense of it ever since. Now, although the, the principle has been high orthodoxy, there have been a few notable dissenters. And the most obvious of these is Hegel. So last week uh, I talked about Hegel and his theory of motion. and. Uh, if you think this is right, then, as we saw, then uh, motion produces true contradictions. Now, uh, you may or may not think Hegel was right. However, uh, he clearly did not accept the principle of non-contradiction. In fact, his dialectic was based on the thought that contradictions can hold sometimes, and that progress consists in some sense of... Uh, transcending them, whatever that means in Hegel. However, um, even though there have been few dissenters of the principle of non-contradiction in the history of philosophy, nowadays, because of the rise and the possibility of paraconsistent logic, some uh, people have started to take dialethism more seriously and just reject the principle of non-contradiction. What I'm going to do in the rest of this talk today is to uh, give you a couple of examples. There'll be some more next week, but let's start with a couple of reasonably straightforward ones. The first example I'm going to give you is from uh, the philosophy of law. Now, um, legislatures cannot make some things true by fiat. Uh, they cannot make it true, for example, that the moon is three miles away from the Earth. That would be crazy. But some things, duly constituted legislatures, can make true by an act of fiat. Uh, 
So, for example, I can, if I'm part of a legislature, I can make it the case that some people have the right to vote, some people don't have the right to vote. All I have to do is, uh, with my colleagues in the legislature, pass the uh, appropriate legislation to establish that. Okay, now, let's suppose that you have a piece of legislation uh, which has the following clauses. This is an hypothetical example. Real cases in law are always contentious, so I'm going to give you a toy example. Let's suppose that the law has these two clauses. No woman may vote. Another clause, all property holders may vote. Okay, now you can suppose that at the time when this legislation was passed, uh, the thought that a woman might hold property was actually inconceivable. So, uh, legislators never bothered to uh, worry about the possible conflict between these two things because it just wasn't a serious possibility. Uh, and had it remained that way, no contradiction would ever have arisen. However, let's suppose that as time moves on, some women do become property holders. Now, uh, what happens then when a woman uh, turns up at the polling booth and demands the right to vote. Well, what does the law say? The law says that this person is a woman and so she may not vote. The law says that all property holders may have a right to vote, have a right to vote, and this woman is a property holder. So she does have the right to vote. Now clearly, in the new contingent circumstances, this law has produced a true contradiction. I might know that there are various mechanisms in law for reduce for, for defusing prima facie contradictions, but not such as to apply to this kind of thing. Now, if this situation were ever to arise, then of course the law would be changed because the law is ser to serve a practical purposes and this is not very practical. Legislation would be changed or a judge would make a ruling. However, that is necessary precisely because we were in an inconsistent situation before. In other words, before the law is changed, we have a dilithia. Okay, so this is the first example of a dilithia uh, I'll mention. I might say that the examples I'm going to give you are contentious. However, you can discuss them and make what you will of them. Let's turn to uh, a second and very different example. So. In the history of Western philosophy, there are many philosophers who've thought about the limits of thought, the limits of language, and whether, in fact, there are such things. And many of the great philosophers have argued that there are things which are beyond the limits of thought, beyond the limits of language. And if so, of course, they can't be talked about. Let me give you three examples. The first is Immanuel Kant. So in the Critique of Pure Reason, he distinguishes between phenomena, things that can be experienced, and noumena, essentially things that can only be thought about, they can't be experienced. And what Kant argues at great length is that when we make statements about things, we have to apply certain categories, certain grammatical constructions, and these can apply to things, only things in space and time, which are phenomena. So we can't apply the categories and therefore make statements about noumena. Now, uh, there's obviously a problem here because the critique of pure reason is full of statements about noumena. So on the one hand, Kant is telling us that uh, there are things you can't talk about, but he is talking about them. Let me give you a second example of this. Uh, Wittgenstein in the Tractatus talks about the relationship between language and the world. And uh, he argues that uh, propositions, statements we make about the world, are, are composed of names. Um, and the names are arranged in a certain form. So a proposition has a form. A form is essentially the way that the names are put together. But form is not an object. It can't be an object. It's the way that the objects are put together. So it can't just be another object. It follows from that that you can't make statements about form because it's not an object. But the Tractatus is full of statements about form. So here is another example of someone saying there are things you can't talk about and yet talking about them. A third example. 
Heidegger in Being in Time, Sein in Zeit, starts by posing the Seinsfrage, the, the question of being. What is it to be? What makes something be? And immediately he tells us something very important, namely being cannot just be a being. It can't just be another object. It's what makes objects objects. It's what makes beings be. So uh, in answering the Seinsfrage, you cannot say that being is a being. But of course, to answer the Seinsfrage, you have to say something like being is so-and-so. And that treats it as a being. So you can't answer the Seinsfrage. Um, Heidegger became very aware of this. In fact, it's worse. You can't even ask the Seinsfrage because to say what is being is treating it as an object. So here's a third example of something that cannot be talked about, being, because it's not a being, and yet Heidegger says plenty about what being is. Now, uh, you may or may not subscribe to Kantianism, Wittgensteinianism or Heideggerianism, but if you do, you are stuck with this contradiction. Now, all the three philosophers that we've been talking about uh, realised that they had a problem with an apparent violation of the principle of non-contradiction, and all of them said things to try to defuse the issue. I'm not going to go to them here now, except for just mentioning one of those, and that's what Wittgenstein says in the Tractatus. So at the end of the Tractatus, Wittgenstein faces the fact that uh, he's been talking about things like the form of a proposition, uh, which by his own lights you can't do. And he says, gritting his teeth, that his book is meaningless. So the final stunning conclusion of the Tractatus is, well, my whole book has been meaningless. Uh, Wittgenstein kind of enjoys this, it's clear, and you cannot um, but admire the, the chutzpah of this. However, uh, it really doesn't work because the Tractatus is not meaningless. You can read it and understand it. Even worse, if the Tractatus really were meaningless, then uh, this would be, as the English say, soaring off a branch on which Wittgenstein is sitting. He's undercutting himself because if the Tractatus is meaningless, then it can't establish anything. In particular, it can't establish that you can't talk about form and therefore it can't motivate the view that the Tractatus is meaningless. So uh, Wittgenstein's move, interesting though it is, won't work. Um, so the philosophers we've been talking about really do seem to be stuck with uh, a dialethia, assuming their theories are right. They're telling us that certain things cannot be talked about, and yet talking about them, indeed explaining why they can't be talked about. So if you accept one or other of these theories, then what you have to do is accept, I think, the dialectic nature of these positions. So we've been talking about dialethism, the view that some contradictions are true, and I've given you a couple of examples of what at least some philosophers think are dialethias. One concerns contradictory legislation, and one concerns the limits of thought. Uh, in the next lecture I'll give you some more examples, but that's enough today.